We'll double check why. Hey, I'm gonna double check and say hey again, just in case it cut off the first few seconds. But um, so we are back. We're back with Crawl Cash, Jag Longer, and Crawl the Arisen. And uh, there's a. It, it was funny. The loading screen. I, I, whenever I alt tab to check on the uh, OBS, and I don't know if other people have this. If, if other people use OBS and stuff like that, but um, they record the. If the loading screen would not go, I changed the setting in OBS, and it's, and I found, so I was like, okay, so the loading screen, for some reason, when I don't have it, doesn't like it, and then when I'm seeing an OBS, it changed the Kenji, I'm like, oh, it's working. <laughs> so you can have a funny uh, little little beginning that way, but, okay, so we are back to Kenji, we are back again, and we're still a mongrel, if I remember correctly, yep, we're still a mongrel, basically free m money capital of, um, of Kenji. Uh, there's a lot of places you can get free money, but again, this is one of the better ones. Uh, we still have bounties on on in from the UC. We still have a lot of bounties uh, and and the shack area, I think. And I think they may have even just kind of forgiven crawl kit. Yeah, it looks like no, no, they haven't forgiven him. They have yet to forgive him for that. But um, if someone if you're coming into the series a bit late. Uh, just so you know, we're kind of going with Band of Bones kind of gameplay, so, uh, don't expect necessarily that we're going to be super nice with a lot of the major factions. However, I will say, and, and this is actually one thing, I feel like, uh, I mentioned a lot of Kinchy, I mentioned a lot of Kinchy stuff based on just experience I've had in the game. A lot of different lore stuff. But I do have to give Kinchy credit that there's one thing that it does a lot better than almost every other RPG. And that's it. Doesn't make the it doesn't uh, have the um, religious system have to like have to be like obviously right or okay. By by that I mean is is like the uh, in Skyrim for example, the divines are literally a source of basically power in that game, right? So the only problem I have with that game is sometimes they'll go, oh, but that person's you know that person is acting on this, right? Like kind of like with like um like how people have like the stormcloak and the rep, uh, the stormcloaks and the imperials is the whole conversation gets really complicated when you go, but they objectively have an afterlife. <laughs> they objectively have an afterlife. I kind of and it's provable in that setting, so it's like really difficult to argue. Uh, we're quite, it's funny when I was doing Morrowind too, and they hand, they handles actually quite a few things. I wonder if he actually kind of, I wonder if the guy who made this game um actually learned from kind of our other the earlier rpgs we're running around a little bit just to get athletics up also because i'm waiting to hear the screams of <laughs> of someone getting torn apart to know well i forgot we put a bunch of bait out so we probably won't hear any uh we call it random screaming to go check out um we do have beep chasing us but uh we just want to ignore him <laughs> we don't want to ignore him because we're going for band of bones band of bones are mostly a check bandit group but uh, they also, I think it also handles just, um, we call it, we call it just species tension a lot better too. Because I think the hardest, the, the weirdest part about the Elder Scrolls thing is, is that it makes it, makes it, especially, and this ties into like the, we call it, the uh, making a, uh, one faction's religion like definitely accurate or inaccurate uh, beyond a provable doubt. I mean, it's better to do inaccurate than accurate. Because once it's accurate, oh yep, there we go. We got some eating. Once oh, we got some people chasing us. Um, hmm. I don't know why there's so many of the, those guys there. We'll have to kind of get rid of these guys first. But it's, it's better to lean toward doubt uh, being doubted than it being uh, confirmed. Because then the difficulty becomes well. Then you know, well, then then you have an objective answer. You have an you you have a virtually objective answer. I, mean, I guess in the Skyrim one, they're more like Greek, they're more like Greek, uh, a Greek pantheon than a uh, what call it than something that would be more problematic for uh, deciding who was right and wrong. By that I mean is is that since they're since each one's kind of got a personality, they can personally in a way be wrong. Like let's say. If you played Skyrim, if you played uh, not just Skyrim, but any Elder Scrolls game, and let's say you know about like uh, Akatosh, for example, or Julianos, right? They might not agree on something, which is important because if they agreed on everything, 
then you would have an objective. Oh, poor Beep's going to get in trouble if we could do that. You have an objective right and wrong, and it's just whatever they said. Which, ironically, I think I'm... It's funny, every time I play it, I just have a hard... I, I just have a hard time, like, I feel like that's why a lot of people like the alternate start mod. Is because the problem becomes really problematic. Because, realistically, it doesn't make sense to, at the beginning to join anyone but the Stormcloaks. Because you're about to get executed by the other one. So the default assumption is they were going to still execute you, right? So... Unless you were an Imperial, if you're playing as if, like, you're saying that unless you're, like, an Imperial Legionary, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense why you'd run with the person who is just trying to execute you. You do get a chance. I do applaud them for having a chance later on to switch factions. I do like that. Um, Kinchi, Kinchi's factions are very, very neat. Uh, however, um, there are some elements where you get locked into one and you can't switch. Um, for example, turning in some high-level bounties to the shack will make it where the holy nation hates you or vice versa and then that's it uh the closest equivalent in something like the elder scrolls games is like the jagged throne and that jagged throne dragon jagged crown i think it's called but uh we'll say why are you following me beep oh he just he's still following us okay we can still talk to him later but you know what Let's go down. We can get free money. We can get free money now. And free crossbow experience. I think I already showed how kind of crossbows need to get a little work done, though. I think they learned a lot narratively. I think whoever made... I, I, again, I wish I knew the guy's name. But, um... I think the guy who made the game knows knew learned a lot of narrative... Of good storytelling tips. Um, there's a little balancing... And it, I would say that the balancing probably got a little... I think as soon as crossbows came in, the balancing got a little weird. But, you know, at the same time, balancing isn't, you know... Recall, you could argue Kinchi's probably somewhat, maybe not even aiming for a balanced experience. So, it could be an in intended feature rather than a bug. But I mean, is it's a... Uh... Okay, we just shot each other in the back. Let's run. He's then supposed to be that the world's unfair. Keep shooting. There we go. We're going to get really good at these crossbows. Especially since they're as fast as they can shoot because they're the, uh, the toothpick. We can just stun lock. Especially with these guys because they don't... Um, they really don't have many defenses to stop us. We can get some good precision in here. There we go. Just in case we hit each other. Because we have hit each other once or twice. And the good thing is is that since it's not based off of their abilities, our crossbow skills uh, aren't affected by their abilities. Pretty much as long as we're good at crossbows, it doesn't matter who we're fighting. They're, they have a high chance of just dying. The good thing is we left a lot of bait there. Now, I could probably just knock them out, but I do want to get crossbow skills. So it seems like I'm I'm fighting them needlessly when I could knock them out and I and you know because it's night and we have good assassination skill. That's a that's a reason why. Is that I actually want to um, get my crossbow skill up. And there's not many better targets to do it against. I mean, these guys are really really good option, a really really good option to to raise up your skills against. As long as you don't get knocked down, which is not too hard to avoid as long as you fight the basic enemies. But um, I think I, I do enjoy Kinchi's iteration of it a little bit. The iteration of the how it handles that a little bit better just because um, again it's high fantasy. You could argue that that's high fantasy versus something like this which would be like low fantasy slash sci-fi slash apocalyptic. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say what it is. I guess it's not really that fantasy esque, except beyond the melee weapons and the, um, and and that it's sword punk. I think it was what how the creator described it. I think that was technically what he what what he described it as. Which I, I would agree, I would agree. It's kind of its own thing, but it's handled a lot better because even D and D that's a big problem. 
Because it's like, okay, so the paladin's following an objective deity that determines, like, your afterlife. The rogue stealing something is is the unreasonable thing, not the paladin wanting to to listen to the, uh... To, it, it would act like the, ro- the rogue's the reasonable one and the uh, paladin one's not. And I, I play rogues. That's the irony. I play as rogues. All the time. But I play, like, a rescuer rogue, where basically, um... I, I I have a whole grapple. I, I should I should try to print print that out at one point. Now that's Pathfinder, but I basically had this whole rescuer build is entirely built on evading having people evade grapples because the GM we had at the time only wanted to ever use grapples on people, right? It was his favorite mechanic in the game apparently. By that I mean is you just used it all the time, so it just came up all the time. So. And we had some fun time. We had some fun ones, but if it was a lot more fun once we had that build up and running, because then it, then we had some counter me- some countermeasure. Um, besides just kind of being strong characters, she's the only other countermeasure. There's not many ca- clever countermeasures for being grappled. <laughs> besides, like a rescuer build, so something like that was uh, at least something where we got some agency with that. Knock him out. And again, we even if they spot us, it does not matter. They will not do anything about it. It's literally free money. We can just come up here and just start slapping them. There we go. Free money. And free assassination skill. Let's have Jag Longer knock some people out. Whoop. See, yeah, they even see us. They just don't care. It's free money. This is the exploit run. We did one run where basically we restricted ourselves pretty heavily. Oh, there we, I forgot we took an arm for food for, uh, food for, oop, I put an arm on him. Food for, um, what do we call him? Crawl, crawl the dog, crawl the arisen the dog. Okay, we got these guys. Okay, come back. We gotta shoot these guys (laughs) this time. Because this, because we want to get some shooting experience, and there's no real reason to knock those guys out because they're not the fast ones. They're the heavies, which are a little bit slow, a little bit slower compared to the princes and things like that. So, and we already got all the free money we needed, I think, right? Yeah, we we already took all the free money we needed. So you fire at that one, and you fire at that one. There we go. Seems right. Uh, this is probably not the best lineup since we were, like, one in front of the other, meaning we'd easily shoot each other, but... Precision is something to boost. But I do like how Kinchi handles it a little, a little bit better. The, uh, the divine system, or how... Basically, the religious system in the in its lore. And now, Morrowind is an exception. Morrowind's kind of really cool. Morrowind, it's religious... It's the, how it handles the religious system in that is really cool, really unique. Um, but Skyrim suffers kind of the same issue as D&D of, of you kind of, as soon as you start adding afterlives in, right, of like defined afterlives and then especially like basically like outlying exactly what determines it, then you get, get into the, com- like the, the complicated scenario of that you have no, in- that the internal logic of your game, it becomes... You lose the internal logic of your game, and it becomes basically what... Um, it becomes a real-life m- uh, morality simulator. But I mean, is it just becomes like you do what you would do rather than what you do in the setting. In Kinchi, for example, there's a... There, they like Everyone... You could argue that in some, some elements, people do that in Kinchi, but to a far lesser extent, uh, because there is an in-lore in view of, th- of of topics such as Akran, such as how the UC do, you know enslaves people, or stuff like that. There are in lore explanations and how they and how it's viewed and how people view it. It's addressed, right? But nobody kind of addresses the fact that sovereign guard, that like the bar for sovereign guards, real low, <laughs> and how kind of technically by we call it te- te- technically because. Uh, it doesn't matter what side they both go, both Imperials and Stormcloaks end up there. And if you don't count the Dragonborn, because technically you could argue the Dragonborn is basically the equivalent of a demigod in a Greek sense, 
You see what I'm saying? It's basically like Troy and it becomes basically like Troy and the Greeks. Uh, where it's not a mora- it's not a, it, like it like in that setting, it's not even a moral issue. It's do you like Zeus or do you like uh, you know this, you know, this other one? You're in who one you know Athena wants somebody to win, Zeus wants somebody to win, Poseidon wants somebody to win. They're not really concerned about the morals of it, and I feel and I feel like that that takes away a little bit of it because um you had you had very similar issues in Morrowind, but they were hand but lore wise they're handled a lot better. I, and, and the funny thing is, I'm again, I'm not. I, I just started back playing Morrowind, just back playing Morrowind, uh, or not back to playing Morrowind, except the one time I tested uh, uh, tested it out. But um, I ju- and it's not even like a so it's not necessarily a nostalgic thing because I only had that one opportunity to test out with a kid as a kid. It's just handled a lot better because I can explain kind of one thing saying it's culture v change right whereas the imperials versus the nords it's like i'm not imperials versus nords imperials versus the stormcloaks it's uh blue guy you know blue wearing guy versus wet red wearing guy one was gonna cut my head off (laughs) what one one has one has these kind of issues but then then again, their their own recall afterlife is segregated, <laughs> like they only have like a Nord only afterlife. So it's like it's like how do you explain that? It's like how do you it's like how do you, like how do you handle that in like in lore? Because then you got to go to the Imperial. You got to go like it's like it kind of makes the whole thing really complicated. I think because basically it has it has no bearing on like how like how did they derive their morality? Does that make sense? Like, Kinchi makes sense. Their morality is basically derived off the world around them. But if you were to derive your morality in Skyrim, for example, based off your surroundings, your world around you, the I, the Nords are closer than the Imperials, but the Imperials those just don't make any sense. They're basically a stand-in for the, what do you call it, the Holy Roman Empire, basically. A stand-in for the Roman. They're like half Roman Empire and half Holy Roman Empire. The reason why I mentioned that is just because they... It reminds me a lot of kind of how they deal with the provinces. Because even though Rome had like tributary states, they were they're exactly that more tributary states. Whereas in Skyrim, they treat them more like a client state. And if it's a tributary state, if they if the empire was actually an empire, then then you have the whole argument of well, then empire is just bad because it's an empire. <laughs> it's <laughs> because empire empires are basically by definition forcing people to pay them. To not continuously subjugate them. <laughs> I'd say nobody reads what empire means. An empire literally can't be good. You literally cannot have a good, like, modern view of an empire. You can't mo- have a modern, good empire. It's just not possible. Because It's just not possible because... Uh, now, you could have a good empire if you're going from, from like... If you, if, you, if you make it like a... Uh, we're caught. That it's like... Um, what was I trying to say? You could have a good, like, if you're like, for example, if you're doing a fantasy game, right? Which you could argue, it is, you know, that is what Skyrim is, right? But they don't act like a medieval empire. They act like a mixture of the Roman Empire, but kind of almost like a modern government. And they have kind of like modern modern sensibilities, which would make being an empire bad. <laughs> so I just don't get it. I don't know. I love the empire in uh, we're called in. Uh, the other, like every other Elder Scrolls game, but in Skyrim I had a harder I had a harder problem with it more recently, because the more and more I realize it, I'm like it feels like I'm helping the Empire a lot more because of things I think in real life than anything that you could come to conclusions on in the game, which is that the other point of the game is it's a role playing game. You know what I mean if you're playing an anti slaver in Kinchi, it's because you can make you can easily justify your character hating the you know hating the slavers of the UC. Because of someone, you know, them taking you when you're down immediately, right? There's a there's an obvious consequence. You're not special. You're subjugated to that, right? You're subjugated to that if something bad happens to you. So you can derive that with your role playing, right? Um, that's not so much in 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 some other games, and I'm, it's really sad. And believe it or not, as much as as much of a hard time as people sometimes give Mass Effect. It technically had a good description of, of its right and wrong system. It didn't even say good or bad. It said Paragon or or Renegade. It was more based off of like Wild West 
archetype of the, you know, the white hat versus the black hat, um, which is like the hat that, you know, the, the anti-hero, uh, which is another term for like the anti-hero or, or the squeaky clean sheriff, right? The anti-hero would always have a dark hat um, and, and dressed in dark clothes. And the, the, the squeaky clean hero always wore like the white hat. Like you can see it like with the difference with Clint Eastwood and John Wayne and stuff like that. John John Wayne being more squeaky clean sheriff and who and the and Clint Eastwood being the the uh oh we ran into a pack of them. That's a huge pack of them. Huge pack of fogmen. We're fogmen hunters, I've realized. We're literally fogmen hunters. I didn't think I'd see the day where I'd become a fogman hunter. <laughs> Oh, there we go, and like, 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 it kind of feels like we're actually becoming hunters of them because of, we're basically chasing herds of them. Immediately, just to fire into them for training, but but since we run faster than them, there's just nothing they can really do. Hopefully, you guys enjoy that gameplay because it's funny to watch. But is it balanced? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like they have a. I don't know how much. I don't know. But you know, Kinchi does have an argument of where it may it may be it's unbalanced against you sometimes. Sometimes it just does unfair things to you, and sometimes you get to do unfair things back. Like you're limited on how many people you can have in your faction. Woo. Pretty extensively. Whereas enemies you can just have hundreds of them. So you could argue there's a there's a a level of where you get away with some stuff, but then they get away with some stuff. But I like Skyrim. I always enjoyed Skyrim. I was a little bit tainted, uh, tainted uh, opinion toward it toward the beginning because it literally was bugged, so, and I couldn't play it when it first came out. I was super excited for it because I loved Morrowind. But and and initially you don't really see some of the story pro- telling problems until later on, and you're like, eh, I mean, technically, when you really think about it, if it wasn't for Alduin, right? Basically. With the storytelling in the world, it's really actually hard to justify the Im- Imperials. It's act- without going into a uh, real world an- a real world argument, right? Woo! Get away! Get away! Oh, oh, that's not good. Okay, let's pick. Uh, where where'd she drop? Okay, let's pick her up. They're going to try to pick her up, but we can do it before they do. Okay, let's pick her up and run back. And let's throw her on a, the, the Shinobi Thieves Tower bed. Because you have to think of it this way. They, they're literally, their literal afterlives are divided. So it's like, well, I mean, when you think about it, when you have it that, when you have it that way, basically their entire world around them is set up. To have them believe something that is not really good, you know, not good at all, right? But literally, they're like literal, we call it basically godlike figures, which is like the Adra and the Daedra, right? Basically, are setting themselves up for for failure in that. So you got to really say that the bad guys of Skyrim are not really the Stormcloaks; it's the it's the Adra and the Daedra. <laughs> it's the Adra and the Daedra, really. Because they're like, how hey, you know, let's set up a record, let's set up a system in which we basically encourage them all to hate each other. <laughs> so you could like without so it's really hard to say that now technically the good guys in Skyrim are very clearly whoever the Dragonborn helps, just objectively. And this is re- the reason why I say that is because if you look from a perspective of in a setting whatever divine figure there is, if you look at it from whatever divine figure or whatever figure made the world, if they determine morality, then the Stormcloaks would, or the Stormcloaks would be right if, uh, if nothing happened. But the Imperials would be right if the, if the Dragonborn helped them. But the Stormcloaks would be right if the, Imper- if the, if the, uh, we call it, helped them. If the, if the Dragonborn helped them. It's weird because you're basic, because basically it goes into Greek mythology in which, Basically, morality just goes out the window because you basically have Zeus, the Zeus figure, doing a whole bunch of random things, and so morality kind of doesn't really associate in their story a lot of their stories. I mean, there are moral tales in like Greek mythology, but a lot of them are more like fairy tales and stuff like that. A lot of morality in Greek society came from philosophy, which there's just not a lot in Skyrim. <laughs> this is not a lot in Skyrim. 
And Kinchi, you don't have that. I don't know. I don't need to be... I feel like I bashed on Kinchi a little bit with some things. And so I, I want to share the love a little bit. And kind of mention that it's got a lot of good things to it. But it allow it, it, it doesn't make it, it doesn't put you in a situation of where it's wanting you to use real world knowledge, because I feel like that's the part, the biggest uh, failure, like the biggest kind of storytelling failure. Everything has storytelling failures. Anything I've ever done, anything anyone's ever done, anyone ever was done, it, it, it's always had storytelling failures. You can have the best thing in the world, and there's something they screwed up. It doesn't mean it's terrible, but generally, from what I found from the most recent. Uh, and when you know they might fix that in the Elder Scrolls Six, <laughs> they might fix that. For example, they might fix some of the stuff in Kinchi and Kinchi Two. Albeit Kinchi has less of a lore issue and more of a balancing issue. Um, but if they come out and say if the, the developers of Kinchi go, you know what, we're not going to balance it because it's an unfair world, then technically it's within their design scope. People bought Kinchi because it wasn't going to be fair or catering to them. So that's that's totally reasonable to just not balance it. Because um, there are other ways that's balanced against you. against you. Because right now you could just go up and knock out Catlon. Like it would be it would be a little anticlimactic, but you could just go up and knock out Catlon and just avoid any conflict with them and I don't want to spoil. I shouldn't have said the name, so not to spoil. But there's a bad guy. Oh, not bad guy. Uh, there's a character named Catlon, Catlon, uh, which you may come in conflict with. Uh, I won't tell you where, but you could just knock him out, and that would be the end of it. And it wouldn't be very um, flashy. But you know, that's kind of the world of Kinchi. Life is unfair in Kinchi, and that's kind of the point. So it make you know, it kind of works. Whereas. Um, you kind of run into, which is Todd Howard's thing. That's Todd Howard's saying. It just works, which is ironic because I was talking about Skyrim with it. But uh, Sky, Skyrim and, and other Elder Scrolls things, oh, most of the Elder Scrolls do pretty well. I'd say, well, the mo- like Morrowind and Oblivion do pretty well. I know some people would hate on Oblivion too, but I really liked Oblivion. Oblivion was technically my first um, Elder Scrolls game. Which technically Kenji does have the benefit of it setting the bar for all future Kenji games. Is is if they just improve, if they just improve and don't unimprove. I think that, however, I will say, and this is a prediction. This is a prediction. I think the, I think the developers of Kenji have wrote themselves a little bit into a corner, and that's one of the reasons why I think they're doing a prequel. Now, part of it is because. You know, it's just the obvious part of it. you couldn't really write a sequel because then they would have to predict what you did in this one. But the prequel, they also can't have anything that would be undone. Does that make sense? Like, if they let you do something that prevents Vinge from ever existing, right? Then Kinchi never happened. Kinchi 2 happened, but then Kinchi 1 never happened. It's weird because it's a prequel. I kind of, I'm starting to understand why Star Wars did do. The number thing, because then later on, it makes sense. <laughs> because you're like, oh well, the, the prequels. When you're saying the episode one of Star Wars, they know you mean the one that happened earliest. Whereas in Kinchi, in Kinchi, um, you're gonna have that weird issue of where Kinchi two, and you're like, yeah, the one that happened before, and they're like, no, 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 the one that happened after. You know, Kinchi two came after Kinchi one. That, that kind of odd transition there, <laughs> where, they, where you're trying to explain what you're talking about. I spent too. I probably spent way too much time determining, or trying to just think of all the potential awkwardness. Some games will give conversations with their number schemes or plots, but for a long time, I always, I never helped any other faction than the Empire because I did Oblivion. And Oblivion, the Empire's like just objectively the good guys, basically. They're just the good guys. You can't really help the other side because the other side is literally the, like, a, you know, Meru's Dagon trying to destroy the world. So the Empire's just good guys. But then when you look at, uh, in fantasy, in the fantasy thing, it's like, well, worst case scenario, right? If it wasn't for the dragon crisis going on in Skyrim, 
They could all just die and go to their respective afterlives. Gets rid of the point of really wanting an adventure, you know? I that's that's the hardest part I have with D and D. Like with when when you start getting like if there's a focus, the biggest hard, the hardest time I have with D and D when the focus is on uh, characters with like clerics. Like I have a hard time with clerics and paladins being involved. Um, I don't mind the dark powers being involved because that doesn't necessarily deal with what the right thing to do is. But as soon as a deity is involved, it's like okay, the party's got to do that. Because if they don't, you're basically going, well, you're screwed in the afterlife. <laughs> And, like, nobody really considers it. Or the GM kind of goes, oh, well, they've forgiven you. It's like, ah, would they forgive you for, like, murdering a town? Like, would you really? I mean, I did some stupid... I did a really stupid thing in the D&D game. And in hindsight, I realized it was pretty stupid. Um, to my defense... to my, In my defense, it made perfect sense for the character I was playing to do. But Heinz, but but that's exactly what like everything starts off bad with. I I know that sounds like as soon as someone hears, but that's what my characters do. They get like flashbacks of where they're just having they're, they're having like oh no not again. This is ha- I know where this is going. But in on all seriousness though, in all seriousness though, there's nothing wrong if your character to do it as long as it doesn't screw over your fellow team members, especially when you're with team members that are doing the same thing. But I mean, is they're acting on their behavior. Because just preface this, we were in, we were playing both neutral characters that had basically never been around society. Prefacing it, never been around society. One person was lost. Okay, one person was part. Like I was playing a drow that was lost. Literally, got like was betrayed and left. And he was a drow druid because he was supposed to be a fighter initially, and then he got abandoned in a we call it into in a cave. Uh, but he got betrayed, basically. By uh, He got betrayed and abandoned in a, because he's a bodyguard. Because they basically have like a matriarchal society and they have houses. And so since he was a dude, all he could really de- be was like a big bodyguard. Or turn into like a drider kind of thing. Uh, but So that was what he did, is he was the bodyguard. But then he kind of he, he got abandoned in basically the Underdark. And he basically ended up becoming an Underdark Druid. Because I saw the Underdark Druid and I was like, I want to do an Underdark Druid. But and I just basically argued they just didn't. He just lost the evil from being in drow society. That is typically a lot of drow society has. It's just a very, very, very heavy evil bend toward it. So I just said he became kind of just true neutral because he just wasn't around for people so long that just morality just wasn't really ever a concept. Because technically, technically, evil is knowing something's wrong and doing it anyway. Not doing something, and that's a big thing. Not doing something, and not knowing it's wrong, and then it was a bad thing. That's amoral. That, that, that a lot of people forget about amoral or misattribute amoral. It's really hard to be amoral. It's virtually impossible. Kinchi is the closest thing where you can be an amoral character, uh, but amoral is technically impossible for a human to be. Technically, technically impossible because you have on some level. A basic knowledge of that was a kind of a jerk move, right? You would literally have to be isolated from society for basically your whole life to be an amoral character, which this character kind of was. But so basically, he's like the closest friend this guy had was spiders, basically. Like by that I mean it's not like spiders, like pet spiders. I'm talking like literally just wild, man-eating spiders. So he, so and the other one was a dragonborn, which really great guy who played him, right? That was a dragonborn rogue, right? But he was playing a rogue. He was a roguish character. He was a nice guy. He was a nice character. The character was supposed to be nice. But he was also kind of distanced from society. He didn't really... He didn't. He, he kind of... And, and kind of had a kind of a quirky personality of where he kind of um, didn't really... I don't know. He, he kind of he kind of just face valued a lot of stuff. The character was very very du- like direct, not really overcomplicating things. Very fun character. Very funny, fun and funny character, right? So you could say, okay, that sound that sounds all right. You know, in this game, in this game, that sounds kind of like characters you'd see in Kenshi. That, that's you know, you kind of start off. You can start off as basically, literally a wanderer with nobody or someone who got just abandoned, right? And Kinchi, you run into things where you have to make decisions. So he got pickpocketed. And kind of like in Kinchi, you can get pickpocketed, right? But 
the funny thing is, is the situation was probably supposed to go down kind of like how Kinshi has its situation of getting pickpocketed going down. Which is, oh, you talk to the pickpocket and you become friends, right? Or you 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 or you chase the pickpocket and you find something special. In this case, you know, Kenshi leaning more to become you become friends. The D and D game more leaning toward that you're supposed to chase them so you you get somewhere along the way, right? Very understandable. Basically, a, a venture hook. Problem is, my guy's a druid who also knows how to throw fire. <laughs> also, also, uh, what call also. Basically, basically can't distinguish humans apart. And also, can I mention that the, that these two adventurers have already killed a kid earlier in the journey because they accidentally resulted in the mother's death because we accidentally sent them back on a trapped path by accident. So both the dragonborn rogue and the other ones like, well, what would you do? You know, what would you do for an animal that you can't take care of? Well, the quickest o- option was, oh, well, you just kill it. So they just killed <laughs> They just kill them. So we're playing neutral characters. It was established. They were playing not just neutral characters, but characters that basically have no concept of what society is, right? And no concept of society and also no resources in society, right? So basically, totally, ba- basically cavemen. Basically cavemen, right? And caveman morality of basically going, well... Well, the worst thing, you know, he'll starve otherwise and just kills him, right? Because his own only provider died, right? So we're, that's the characters we're playing. Literally characters with no concept of society and like going, oh, well, we could have took him to an orphanage, right? And then later on fed him to a magic monster that wanted to eat him. But that was after he was dead. So, you know, that, we didn't have that planned. <laughs> we didn't have that planned. <laughs> we didn't have that planned. That was secondary. But so you you know so far so good right, but then end up we call it killing the uh, killing a sec uh, pickpocket a second pick, uh, pickpocket which ends up later it turns when we turn around because it turns it turns out that was a kid so basically there's a theme of where our character is so our character so far have apparently killed a lot of kids and the village is now coming after us right, and the GM's understandably upset because right now it seems like we're an evil party. But the funny thing is that we're not playing an evil party. And that's exactly why I like Kinchi, because you're not necessarily evil, even if you do evil things in Kinchi, because it's explainable because your character your character might just come from an area where that makes a lot of sense. For example, someone from the UC might be a slaver for a long time before changing changing sides because they don't you know that's what was always what they did. Now, I honestly think that the UC's explanation for slavery in the game is kind of a little weak of going, hey, well, no one else could farm the stuff. That's like the weakest argument ever. (laughs) The weakest argument ever is, well, no one else would do it. (laughs) Well, no one else would do it. Unfortunately, I'm sure that's probably been a reason in the past. We didn't just go hunt these guys. I've been waiting for them. But it's probably the weakest explanation I've seen in any game ever. And <laughs> that's why I have a hard time with it. UC's hard to justify because like it like they basically call themselves evil on a daily basis. At least uh, technically the holy the uh, we call it the holy nations got better propaganda than them. I mean literally once the country itself is calling once you got the uh the UC calling itself basically evil on a daily basis, it's like, well, I mean it's hard not to really agree when they have terrible things in it. I mean, it's hard not to agree it's evil when basically it calls itself evil. So the UC is hard to really side with. The Shek and the Holy Nation at least kind of are smarter and don't try to like make everyone who could potentially join them uh, hate them immediately. I mean, the Holy Nation does that except for everyone except humans and Scorchlanders, but. Also, they're saying, like, the whole farm thing. They're saying, well, no one else would farm. But then if you build a farm, they tax you, they tax you really heavily. It's like, well, I mean, if the UC is so desperate in desperate need of farms, then you'd think that they'd be like, hey, with this, we don't have to worry about, you know. I mean, that's the whole point of the Rebel Swordsman is, is basically they're all created by farmers that were bit out, out uh, basically outbid by uh, people who didn't have to pay for their labor. Which, again, is a really awesome lore thing. Right? It's a really awesome lore thing because it makes sense in the world. That would make sense to happen. You know, if you had a bunch of people exploiting free labor versus a you know a bunch of people who are trying to not do that, the people who would not do that would be at a disadvantage. 
because uh, would be at a disadvantage unless they could basically unless they could get people to dislike the stuff. So Kinchi makes sense as a world. It just makes sense a lot as a world. I like it. It's funny. We talk more about philosophy and stories and storytelling than than humor necessarily. <laughs> I see myself as a storytelling stream. How about that? Not a comedy stream. We're a storytelling stream. Storytelling and workshopping stream. Last streams are for, are funny, and we'll have funny moments. We'll have funny moments, but we're a storytelling stream. For sure. We 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 have we actually do and this okay, this might sound a little mean, but we actually do game criticism. But, but, but okay, the reason why I said that might sound mean is because technically that's what YouTube you know, not just YouTubing, but streaming or YouTubing or whatever you call it, is really technically it's the like technically all your um stuff through that is coming through basically the idea that you are reviewing it. You can review it in a funny way. But technically, there's the idea that you are reviewing it. So consider this my my review. <laughs> consider this my review. Is Kinchi has a really well really well made story. Um, not really. Um, n- not necessarily like super blockbuster twist. You know, not 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 the super blockbuster twists. But that's virtually impossible in in the kind of game it is. Because that's for you to do. Because you're the main character. Can't really have a twist without it. Or can't have ma- like tons of twists. There are some twists. But you can't have some serious twists. Uh, when you're when you're limited like that. Also when it doesn't keep track of every single choice you make. With a, with a vague reputation system. It'd be very difficult. Okay we're going to get hit. Okay hit them back. How about that? There we go. I've been waiting for... I have not seen people getting snacked on lately. Which is how I make my money. If you're wondering what we're doing is we're making a lot of money so we can get um, recruits. We're going to need a lot of money to do it, unfortunately. We're going to need a lot of money. Because as you saw from our last like our, our last uh, stream series, uh, we, did not, uh, have, we did not have a really easy time with money. Money and food was tight because we had recruits, but not many ways of making money and not a lot of stored up money. And we spent a lot of money. Oh, can't afford it. So let's go to another shopkeeper. But we need recruits. We need recruits pretty quickly too, because otherwise they're going to miss out on all this leveling. But, you know, if we, we, we get some crossbows, the volley won't matter. It literally becomes basically how archers realistically... By that, okay, so archers realistically were mostly used for a volley fire. Basically with the idea that you shot just a bunch of arrows and somebody hit. Aiming wasn't that important. <laughs> I know people will want to say how great of a master shot certain historical figures were, but it really never mattered. Very rarely did a single archer matter. There were times in which a single archer mattered, or was a big morale boost, right? Or shot some, you know, shot something really important. But oftentimes, it just never really mattered that much to be that good of an archer. It mattered just if if archers mattered, it mattered because you had like a ton of them, and because you had a ton of them, and you just dumped them onto the battlefield. And then they just kept firing and firing and firing until they couldn't fire anything else. Or run away if they got attacked. Because a lot of, especially Central Europe, Central Europe, um, where they didn't have professional archer armies, if they did have archers, they were generally just skirmishers. Where they basically hired on, and if, if they got attacked, they'd kind of just run off. Like, that was kind of the idea. That was kind of the, they weren't really expected to stick around. <laughs> They stuck around. It was kind of like, what are you doing? It's just, you know, we kind of just wanted to just shoot a little bit and run. Now, Romans, if I remember correctly, Romans may have had a better... I I used to know a lot about Roman history, but it's kind of died off in my memory. I learned a lot about it, and then it kind of lost a lot of the information in my head. See, if you see the reload time here, it's 270. Then we could shoot a lot farther, 274.10. Versus, you know, the longest with that one is three seconds, and it's 140. And that's the specialist version, which is equal to that. 
Um, there is a master's, a masterwork eagle's cross. That would be amazing. The only thing is, is that is not a volley fire weapon. It's just not. So oftentimes, even though the eagle's cross is amazing, a lot of times you're actually, you're, you often benefited replicating history and going with volley. Uh, this is a little short ranged, so this might not be the best volley fire weapon. I would say the Mark II's and the Mark I's are significantly better in Rangers. Rangers and old world old world bows are going to be your volley weapons. If you're playing a single hunter, definitely take Eagle's Cross Masterwork 100%. You will love it. I had a crossbow. I, I had a crossbow character, and that was what he used. Um, loved it 100%. Played a, as a hunter. It felt like being a hunter. It was amazing. You had ammunition mattered because you were firing longs. Absolutely amazing. But if you're volleying, volley firing, that makes no sense. <laughs> that is basically, basically all it tells me is that you're you're you know you're running around with way too much money in Kinchi. <laughs> that is literally at that point, it's a flex. It's a flex and not much else because you really, really, really are not benefited that much by having a ton of these because they take so long to shoot. Now the first fire, yes. But you if if you're firing Eagles Cross and you fire and you hit once, you're better off just putting in your backpack, taking another weapon out and attacking. That would work. But um at the same time you could also just if you're good at crossbows just have a faster shooting weapon and just run and shoot. You see why I favor the, the why the toothpick is technically the I, I wanna say technically the best. Uh, it's not the best, but it's technically the best considering the balancing of the game. Except if you're fighting like beak things, because beak things uh you wanna kill that thing before it ever turns to run at you. So you've gotta kill it in like the first shot. Unless it or if it's like a one big enemy. If it's like one big enemy, then sure. To go ahead. Eagles cross perfect. But if it's like a like a, these guys an eagle's cross would literally be a waste. You take one down, you'd be done. Take one down, you'd be done, right? With each hit, you would take one off, you know, take one down. But the thing is, if you hit an arm, the arm's going off, but it's running at you still. It's still going to be running at you. You got to hit a chest shot or a head shot with crossbows. You've got to hit a chest shot or 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 leg shot. You got to hit the legs, chest, or head. If you hit either of the arms, you just wasted your time. You wasted your time against an enemy. It matters for you. If you get shot in the arms, that sucks. Because if you lose an arm, that's a you know a loss. Unless you don't, you know, unless you want to get a robotic limb, which is cool. Uh and in that case it's just a monetary loss. <laughs> you just lose the arm that you bought. And then you just put on another one. But um if you're playing like an Ocranite run, which we did last time with the with the Okay, I can't find any of these guys. That that would be absolutely debilitating because we had a bunch of people who we basically had a whole retirement home of people who were basically getting debil like basically debilitating injuries. And actually, I kind of I kind of would like to see, and this is this like I would like to see some of that dwarf fortress crutch fighting. Now, now you might know what I'm talking about if you don't know Dwarf Fortress, but if your character got a really debilitating injury, they could learn how to use crutches, right? And they could get so good at crutches that basically it was like they weren't injured at all. They could just get really, really, really good, right? So character wasn't necessarily out of the fight. But what I'm saying is I wish there was an alternative that would be lower friendly for uh, people who weren't necessarily wanting to use robotics. Um... And I don't think like clone material would fix it, because that's kind of like a like that would make sense. And if you ever played the tabletop for Cyberpunk, which came out recently, Cyberpunk Red, they have kind of that kind of thing going on. Where you can get like a clone limb, right? But that doesn't really solve the problem of like the Ocranites probably wouldn't like that either. When they wouldn't realize that it's a clone limb, but if you're playing as an Ocranite, they wouldn't like it. <laughs> They wouldn't like uh, it. Would make sense your character not being a huge fan of it. So I, I, you know, you don't have to make role play. You don't have to make role play effective. I think I've mentioned so many times. I, I've had to beat that into my own head so many times whenever I touch ESO because I'm still sad. There's no way to play a actual warrior. And people go, "No, there you can." It's like, "No, you really can't." 
You really can't. Yes, you can role play playing an actual warrior. But you really can't play a warrior like from the actual Elder Scrolls game. You just you, it's not the same kind of warrior. You're playing like a you're playing a ba basically everyone's and someone said it best on a forum. I don't know if I would credit them if I knew their name, but they said uh that it you, everyone's playing a battle mage and that's just true. It's just everyone's a battle mage. You you just have to you know imagine that basically you're all max ranked Skyrim characters and basically you just started going into the other skills because you got nothing better to do. That you just gotta you just gotta headcanon it that way. Because otherwise you're just stuck with doing normal combat stuff. And and the first, the worst thing is is the hope. The idea of hope. You have hope because you're like well because a lot of people got hope with Nightblade, right? Because they got the goat so they go into they go into Dragon Knight and they go, Okay, Dragon Knight and then they see all the Dragon Knight abilities and like, um that's not really warrior y, that's more like battle warrior y like mage warrior y. Right, so I want to let's do uh, let's do Nightblade. That sounds like it, and then that one seems like it's got the most hope since you're like, oh well, it's normally rogues, right? And rogues, you know, they might it makes sense that a magic rogue would have illusion, but there's no way they could make the stamina rogue feel like a mage, but it, it kind of does. <laughs> Mechanic, and I know, I know, uh, what we'll call it. I know that some people will really defend the game, really defend the game because it's not a bad game. And I think that some people defend things because they like the game and they don't want it to be what marks it as bad, right? Like, I play a lot of, like, Black Desert Online and trust me, you hear a lot of stuff when you're playing that game. You hear a lot of people just trash talk it because it has a lot of, like, money shop stuff, right? But you don't need, ever need to use it, right? You don't ever need to use it. Because I've never used a money shop thing on video. Kind of like the... Well, I, what I did in... Star Wars do these, um, what do we call it? Because it was originally you had a pay to play. But I literally have, I have literally not had to do anything. You had a pay to play. So technically, if you count that, then yeah, you paid for it. But besides the entry, uh, besides that, I've never had a pay in like the pay shop in virtually any free MMO, right? But I've, I'm more willing to deal with a like a I'm me personally I'm more willing to do with deal with a microtransaction than I am to deal with me not being able to play the way I want. <laughs> if that makes sense, and if that means I don't want to play with magic in a game with you know in a game where I never had to play with magic before, it was never required. Albeit you know enchanting items depends on if you count that. I mean, that's what I love about we'll call it, Kinchi again. This is that's not really an issue. You can play how you want to play. Crossbow is just the best way to play. Period, and that's an objective fact. <laughs> that's an objective fact. Unless you argue cost effectiveness, then we can get into arguments. We can get into arguments when we get into cost effectiveness. You can get into an argument, but if you're arguing difficulty wise, stealth. Okay, stealth and crossbow are the best in the game. Assassination, stealth, and crossbow. Stealth falls behind in animal fights. That's why crossbow is better because you can't really knock out, or at least as far as my knowledge, I've never tried to knock out a beak thing. Uh, and even though they're faster than you, you can get faster than a beak thing with the right kind of setup or fast enough to be able to shoot it and kill it. So crossbows... Are sadly, are sadly, I love crossbows, but sadly they are not balanced. <laughs> They're not balanced. I love crossbows. They're literally one of my favorite weapons in all games, right? But I just, I don't, I, like, I was really happy when they added that to the Elder Scrolls. I mean, and originally I think Conan Exiles was spo supposed to have crossbows. And stuff like that. So crossbows are definitely one of my favorite weapons in games. Just because they have a lot of practical things. Especially, I think it started because a lot of games with guns that had suppressors. It just felt silly that they couldn't hear you. Because if you ever have heard a suppressor. Or like, have you ever seen someone show how a suppressor sounds? Like, they'd know you're there. They'd know you were there. There's just no way they wouldn't know you were there. Maybe like eventually one day. But a lot of like, where they're showing like, like old, like old guns with old suppressor, like older suppressors. There's just no realistic way that people like 
right next to the person when it's obviously no, you did it. Did we forget to pick up a head? We did. Where is the head? The head of a, a, a fog prince. I see blood. He's around. Oh my gosh, that fog heavy was really tanking it. Toughness does provide armor, so that there there is that. Wait, 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 wait. Is that the fog prince? He's dying. That means he still has his head. There we go. <laughs> there we go. But I don't know. I think fantasy as a genre as a whole has got to work out some issues. Just really, really got to work out some issues. He needs to sit down <laughs> with a bunch of other people. Basically, a lot of people doing different fantasy works need to sit down and make some kind of decision. <laughs> some kind of decision. Because some things just don't make sense in a lot of fantasy stuff. Big issues that need to solve for fantasy stuff that, that sci-fi and apocalypse have worked out. A... How are you going to deal with, with uh, we call it moral issues? Uh, Fallout needs to join the fantasy argument because it, it has an issue with this, unlike some other apocalyptic games. The, well, the earlier Fallouts. The most recent Fallout, not so much. Um, just because there was less... Um, there was no karma system. But the... Uh, the... Uh, and, uh, like the All the... Fantasy big names need to work out exactly how they're going to do their systems. Because if you're going to have an inclusion of deific figures, right? There's only real, there's really only two ways to go. That's either a situation in which the deific figure is no different than a person, right? And is good or bad or whatever, right? They are based off of their actions. They are basically the equivalent of just a very powerful person, Right? Or they are omniscient. You see what I'm saying? They're, or they're omniscient and e either omnisciently good or omnisciently evil. Because otherwise it just it gets confusing. Because that's how Skyrim is, like, is to me. I think Morrowind made way more sense because they went with the, the Greek pantheon perspective. Because technically a lot of the, tri like a lot of the tribunal, everything, they were all fake deities that took or that achieved deityhood through uh, Rakaat through a, like shady means and stuff like that and it was connected to a source of power so if they said something was right or wrong their religion believed it was right or wrong right which makes sense but you as a character weren't held to that but if but in skyrim it's kind of in skyrim it kind of feels like well it's it's a little vague it's left a little vague that's why i've always really liked like a lot of the like anything surrounding the and even it gets funnier with the Argonians. The Argonians have the best time. The, Ar the Go Argonians have it the best off. Okay, but when I say that, I mean the best off narrative. Like by narratively, I mean in lore wise, because it's with the hist. Very simple to explain. Totally understood it. Only needed to hear it once to know what it meant. I got what the hist was immediately. Got what it was. Right. No needed no help to understand what the hist was. Uh, as soon as, you know, through just learning what it was, right? Didn't take a lot to figure out what the hist was. It was a, it was understandable, right? And it doesn't have to be confused. It doesn't have to be easy to understand. But once you know all the information, you should be able to work it out. Um, and come to a satisfying answer. There's just not many satisfying answers when it comes to any of the Adric, the Adra or Adric Pantheon. Um, when it comes to... Oh, you know, we have not been freeing some of these people, which I feel really bad about. Let's, hold on, not, let's shoot that guy. There we go. Shoot him. Oh, he's running away. Oh, no, he's running back. Both of his arms are broken, so this is literally just shooting someone who can't defend themselves. Feels a little bad. <laughs> I, mean, I guess you could argue that you know, Kinchi was never meant to be balanced because this can happen. You can, you can literally run into a situation where we're just blasted both of his arms off. And we're just, you know, it's just target practice at this point. We'll let that guy free in a second, but we'll, we'll shoot this guy first. He's dying. He can't actually hurt us, so we're going to free this guy. Hey! Hey! Don't take a bite out! Don't take a bite out of him! There we go. Or her? Don't take a bite out of her when she's trying, when we're letting him go. Woo! It's canaled. I don't know if I saw that. Woo! Slid. 
You know, we're going to help you before you die. Being eaten alive somehow. How are you being eaten alive still? We're helping you. We're trying to, at least. At the very minimum. Oh, gosh! I zoomed out and I just immediately saw that guy coming for the back of her head. Okay, go ahead. Get him. Oh, we got more people. I didn't see the other ones. Oh, hold on. If I'm going to zoom out, there's going to be an army. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to zoom out, there's going to be an army. And that was exactly what happened. Uh, we tried to free them. She was almost free. <laughs> we can't say we didn't make an effort. When Kinchi, I feel like I have more agency over my character than some fantasy games. Some fantasy games, I don't... Oh, if you consider this fantasy, I don't know. Sword punk, whatever we want to call it. I feel like I have more agency of my character in a game like this. Because I make my own explanations of how it happens. And there's not an in-lore deific figure besides Ocran, which you could argue. But basically, you can choose to subscribe to Ocran or not. It's not told to you whether he's absolutely exists or doesn't exist. Besides characters, whether you trust them or not. Which is exactly how I want it <laughs> in games. I get you can't play a cleric in a game like that. But it doesn't make sense to play a cleric in a game in which you are going to be put beside characters which doesn't even don't even acknowledge your powers. If that makes any sense. Right? If that makes any sense. So, for example, again in D&D, &D, the only way I was able to make myself feel better about doing and like, having to explain that was basically either playing warlocks or rogues. It's pretty much always what I play. And I know that it's like the edgiest too. And the funny thing is, is a lot of times I found that in a lot of games I just play the edgiest thing so that no one else does. Because I know that I'm the only... I, I, I know that at the table I will generally be one of the only ones that will make their rogue a rescuer build with a grapple hook, right? Rather than Batman. <laughs> Rather than Batman. I, well, I, I did make Batman, basically. But what I mean is, Batman, I you know, I'm an orphan... And who lost both his parents, Batman, and not Adam West Batman. That's Adam West Batman is what I emulated. Of where, well, you know, you can't hide a bomb anywhere. These, you can't, you can't throw away a bomb anywhere these days. You know what I mean? He's trying to right throw the bomb. He's got the cartoonishly bo large bomb. And he's trying to find where to throw it. And he's like, he goes one place. There's like a place with a tuba. You can't throw it there. He's got a place. He's got a, we call it. He's got a, he's got a, um. What was it? Then he goes to throw it off the dock, and there's a boat. It's sitting right there. He can't throw it off the dock. The dock, and he acts like it's casual. He's like, "Oh, well, you know, can't throw away these things anymore." It doesn't seem like there's anywhere to throw them. Okay, I think that we got a lot of stuff. I think we need to sell the head. We got a lot of experience. How are we doing on experience? I need to probably set a limit on how far I'm willing to go before we need to start moving into some new ground. As, as, as fun as it is to just crossbow these guys, I imagine it can't be a super amazing viewer experience. <laughs> for, I can't uh, for too long. It's fun, fun. I imagine for a while, but I can't imagine for too long. So we'll we'll find some new people to to shoot at. But I always emulated the Adam West Batman or an H.P. Lovecraft character. <laughs> That's basically what I emul emulated an H.P. Lovecraft character with all we caught. Untrusty, untrustworthiness, and we're caught completed, right? But no, I shouldn't say untrustworthiness. I should say mad, uh, not not madness. Even I didn't play crazy characters. Or I should say power hungry esque. <laughs> there we go. Power hungry esque, or or simply just eldritch behavior, like uh, we call it eldritch behavior, uh, like like basically like how I did with like the warlock. The warlock was basically uh. I may have been the warlock that I, oh, no no I don't know, but the warlock like I played a warlock who wouldn't you call it I played a warlock which was on a search for power and care nothing else but power basically like a Telvanni mage if you played Skyrim basically a Telvanni mage character right which I did two drow characters and then I did a dwarf character which the dwarf character was amazing if you if I've ever one of my friends that played my dwarf played with my dwarf character was really 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 funny. I ended up accidentally naming him the same name, not not knowingly, of a, basically something from Warhammer 40k. <laughs> Did not even know, but in hindsight, it was kind of funny that he was. Which basically, he was just that he, uh, what do you call it? 
is the GM when it basically told me that in his lore, the in the lore of the world that he had, basically the dwarves basically fought off supernatural things. That was basically what they did. So I just made him just all about being clever. Like I used all the items that were unoptimal but were really good. I used I get brought, brought back the grapple hook. We got use the uh, the ball bearings. One of my favorite things in D and D is ball bearings, just because they are just hilarious and one to use. Number two, amazingly smart for an adventurer, for who's a non magical or who resents magic, to replicate a magical effect. Uh, re- amazingly good to replicate, right? But um. A lot of, a lot of, and also I think that one of the fun things I think that they really should have done in Skyrim is if they really, really wanted the Nords to not like, let's say, the Dark Elves and all of them, if they really, really didn't want them to like them, they should have just done, gone the Kinchi way and had them fight them. I know that seems like a little bit like taking the extreme, but at least, at least then, at least, at least then it would have, it would have been a more dichotomy because the, the factions in this are very, very different. Whereas the factions between the empire, the difference between, differences between the empire and the the stormcloaks is sadly kind of weak sauce. <laughs> it's kind of weak sauce. It's not very strong. And again, as soon as you start adding in that divines are basically a hundred percent provable, you know, divines and afterlife are a hundred percent provable in the Elder Scrolls world. You're literally more evil for using a soul trap on a person once <laughs> than than than. Then you are for joining any faction. For joining any faction. Because even with the Dark Brotherhood, there's Sithis. And Sithis is technically a divine-esque being, right? So you could argue that technically, even if you're working for a dark deity, you could argue that that dark deity may, you know, if it cre- you know, if it was pro- if it was in the process of making the world, right, could be a element of the world of of the just the nature of the world. So you could off throw, you could offset all of the bad things onto the dark deity <laughs> and and throw and we're going and and then go like well that's how the setting is kind of like how with the uh, warmer 40k the the space marines are often the good guys quotation marks because not because they're the good guys in real life they would probably not be very good guys in real life because a guy going around like a tank and shooting everyone who doesn't say likes the emperor is probably not going to be your friend who was sitting down but because, um, but rather because in that setting, that's what good is in that setting. Good is that in that setting. And I feel like in Morrowind, they did a lot better establishing that. And in Skyrim, they kind of went, let's have the faction be kind of weak again, like kind of weak argument against each other and kind of undercut the entire Civil War debate, the Skyrim Civil War debate. And undercut it entirely by having the dragon issue, and also by having the divines issue. The fact that both of them end up going to Sovereign Guard, despite whichever one you fight, but then only the Nords, kind of only kind of helps the Stormcloaks and kind of helps the fact uh, it helps the Stormcloaks and the the Empire. But it kind of in fact, if anyone comes out on top in Skyrim, it's ironically the Thalmor because I think all of them are supposed to be Elven deities first, and they're technically arguing that they're that they're the ones who the Elven deities like. So them and Khajiit, Kaj- uh, because I think they said like Khajiit, like that. I think that's what came with ESO, where Akatosh is like his favorite people are the Khajiit. So right there, that's basically that one of the, the divine beings is basically being a favorite, playing favorites. And not to mention Azura basically plays favorites with the Dark Elves. So it kind of had a debate that doesn't make sense for the setting. Because in the setting, the literal deific figures <laughs> are doing that. So it make, doesn't really make a lot of sense that the Empire is going around going, well, they really shouldn't be mean to, you know, mean in this regard, right? That makes sense in real life. Real life for sure. But when your deity, when your literal deities are going around going, that's that group of people, I'm going to help them out. And I'm going to mess them up. Like, Azura literally curses all of the Dunmer. <laughs> literally curses all the Dunmer after helping them initially. Curses them. Literally curses them. So, like, it's really, like, you could, like, in lore, it'd be very, very hard to make that real-world argument. That totally makes a lot of sense. Real-world argument, it's definitely, like, the real-world argument is obvious, right? But in the lore, they're screwing it up at every opportunity by undercutting it with the with the... The fact that the deities are just objectively real. 
<laughs> they're just objectively real. And they're doing the very things that the human characters are saying are not nice. Because because if they follow them, then technically, doesn't that make them wrong? Because they're saying that their deity is wrong. <laughs> I don't know. The Akronites make way more sense than the Empire even. Because at least the Akronites are good and bad based entirely based off what their beliefs are. Whereas the Empire is like, we follow, the, we follow the, this pantheon. And then we have this set of uh, beliefs that we that we mitigate it with, right? We mitigate it with this set of uh, beliefs that we just have as a culture. But then the elves, are, but then but the elves are like, uh, but the elves basically and them both follow the same pantheon. And then they're getting in a fight with the elves, and they're like, "Well, that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense." I don't know. Maybe someone else knows more about Skyrim lore than me, but I, I, if I relate it to Kinchi, I think that Kinchi is way, 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 way uh, easier to to relate to because you know you're not running around in a world. I, I, you know, and I guess that's a subjective opinion. That's a subjective opinion, but in real life, there's arguments of of whether something's real or not, right? It's very difficult to objectively prove something to somebody, and even if you were to try to. And you thought you did, you still from they could very easily find something to say, oh well, this proves me right. Right? Elder Scrolls, that's robbed from you. That's totally robbed from you in Elder Scrolls. You have no counter evidence. There's definitely divines. They're constantly you literally in oblivion watch one. <laughs> you literally in oblivion watch one and fight a Daedra, right? They're objectively real in in, in the Elder Scrolls. So you totally make them the entire arbiter of right and wrong in the lore by doing that. Meaning that technically if you use the real world argument, then you're saying the in-game deities are also bad, but the only people who could technically communicate with the in-game people would be the in-game deities. And so it becomes it becomes complicated and weird. Whereas Kinchi, it makes perfect sense. Holy Nation, you can love it or hate it. But they, but they have a set of values, and even if they're hypocritical, it's portrayed that they're being hypocritical. They and, and they are being hypocritical in the game, whereas in the in Elder Scrolls, it kind of just glosses over. It doesn't mention if someone's being hypocritical. I mean, I guess they did better with the Stormcloaks by saying, uh, "We're caught," by saying um, the whole thing with Kinnereth that Ulfric was being hypocritical by using the shouts, right? So they did that. They did that. That was great, but Kinchi Kinchi is a lot uh, a, a little a little bit better at okay, having more about that. So I don't know. I've talked about how great Kinchi is. <laughs> now I feel less bad for trashing it other times. <laughs> so hopefully that if you didn't know a lot about Elder Scrolls or Kinchi lore, and you wanted to know, I don't mean to be trashing Elder Scrolls lore. Elder Scrolls lore is really fun, but I think that as the games went on, to raise the stakes. As the games went on to raise the stakes, they ended up screwing up your R- your your RPG elements. Basically, there's a, a you know basically, if you're a follower of let's say Mara or something like that, you're not objectively good. You're not objectively good, which is why you would want to play it because that's kind of what you expect when you're playing a divine playthrough. You're not objectively good because some of the things that Mara would do would probably not be what the Empire would do. Or something like that. And if you see... It messes with it. It messes with it. And it doesn't make sense why they don't even recognize that it's not the same. I don't know. I, I like I like my I like my factions like I like my kin, kin, uh, kinchi. Unfair, unbalanced. <laughs> unfair, unbalanced. And with no explanation. Beyond just learn it through stuff. And not characters that... You are are kind of portrayed in in lights that just make it hard to understand. Also, you don't have to deal with starting the game with with having having to make a faction choice. Um, your faction could be chosen for you just because of who you are, which which is or or I shouldn't say it's chosen for you, but some factions are denied to you, which is a lot better than some factions being um, allowed to you. If that makes sense. A lot better to be recorded. I had to have it where a faction hates hates you than a faction saying, "Oh well, recall it. If you did this many things, you're on our side. Doesn't matter if you listen to anything we said. You're on our side because you helped us enough. <laughs> 
it makes some sense, but when you start dealing, especially in Elder Scrolls universe, where basically the smartest thing to do is die, that's literally the smartest thing in the Elder Scrolls universe to do is die before you get soul trapped. That's the smartest thing because there's an objective, and again, in Elder Scrolls, there's an objective afterlife that is in the Elder Scrolls is objectively provable. So it just makes it like, well, why doesn't everyone just just jump off a bridge and then and then just go into the Elder Scrolls afterlife? It d destroys the entire intensity of it. Whereas an Ocarina character could have a crisis of faith. You know, oh, do you know? I could go and fight, uh, you know, the go into black the black desert, right, and fight all the robots. But at the same time, I know I'll die, right? So do you have the character who's like, oh, well, do I want to die that way, and then that just be it? And then you're not given a proof whether that was confirmation or not. The character has to be. It's either you think that he was objectively right, and you think that he got you know the Ocarina's real. Or you think the Ocarina's not real, and then it's a tragedy. The character did all those things and went off to die for no reason. But that's entirely in your view. It's 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 rougher when you undercut it by basically playing the middleman and going, well, no, both of them are kind of good. <laughs> They're both kind of good. They're both kind of good, and they don't have any consequences. <laughs> they don't have any consequences besides this people are a little mean. And this people are more like real world people. <laughs> These people are more like real world people. It, nice in that way, but then don't make sense to be in a fantasy game. If <laughs> it don't make sense to be in a fantasy game. I don't know. That's my, that's my rambling. This is turned into rambling. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. I, ho I hope you guys enjoyed being, uh, coming by and listening. Uh, I imagine you probably would have left now if you had, <laughs> if you didn't. So hopefully that's a good sign. Hopefully it's a good sign for all of us. So ho hopefully you have a good day. Hope you guys have a good one. See you guys later. And uh, have a good day. Have a good day.